Welcome, everybody. Christ is risen. I'm Michal Nemtsu, and I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Brad Nassif from the United States to our club. And uh, it's a truly great joy because I've been in correspondence with Brad uh, probably uh, for like 15 years with a uh, with a great pause in between. But nonetheless, uh, we've been say working together uh, on a on a beautiful publication by Oxford University Press regarding the Philopalia. And uh, right now, I'm very glad to greet him in person. Uh, maybe you should know something about him because he has a very, very impressive CV. And one thing which also we have in common, namely that he was a salesman for Honda. I was a salesman for Herbalife, but let's put it aside. Let's put it aside. He was a, he was a student of the late John Meyendorf. And most of you know that he, John Meyendorf was a, a giant theologian uh, in the late 70s and the early 60s, in, in, the, in the early 80s at the St. Vladimir Theological Seminary. He got his PhD from Fordham University. He also studied uh, biblical theology at various places, uh, Denver Seminary, North Park University. He was, uh, I think you are still there, a professor in Chicago. Uh, he has been a television commentator for various documentaries, but he's very well known and very well regarded for his attempt to bring together two worlds, and that's the world of Orthodox Christianity and Pentecostalism. And I must say, I was just thinking these days that uh, I think this is a topic of, of great urgency for all of us. If you think about how the first millennium looked like, especially in Europe, you pretty much had a united continent around the Nicene Creed, and that was, say, the Orthodox Europe of the first millennium. Perhaps in the second millennium of Christianity, the Catholic Church was the strongest and the most influential. But starting with the 20th century, with the uh, first decades of the 20th century, we see this amazing movement, especially in North America, but later on also in South America, Africa, and Eastern Europe, which is the Pentecostal movement. By the way, Recently, we found out that the only church which is growing in Romania is actually the Pentecostal church. And I think all of us need to know why is that? Why do people actually join uh, this movement? And what is appealing about their missionary strategy, but also about their theology? So without talking too much about the content of the book that Professor that Dr. Nassif has just written, and I'll ask him to uh, to show us the, the cover. I'm once again welcoming you, uh, uh, Brad, and uh, we are very, very thrilled. The way this, this kind of uh, talk goes is like you make a short presentation, up to 30 minutes if you want, and then we have the Q&A, which is pretty much open for the next 30 minutes. Once again, welcome, and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Mihai. Uh... This uh, this was the book that he referred to on the Philokalia that he contributed to. He did a wonderful job on that. So if any of you are interested in it, the book that we're talking about today is the Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church, published by Saint Vladimir's Press, with a foreword by Father Andrew Lauth. So I uh, want to, you know, first thank uh, Mihai for for this opportunity because I cherish the opportunity to build a bridge with the evangelical community. It has been a part of my own life and experience. So I think it might be helpful to give a little bit of context um, since you're giving me a, a good amount of time to talk about the book, why it was written, what it can do, hopefully. Um, I'll definitely uh, would like to do that. So uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, the whole book was, is really part, is a product of my biography. A lot of it has comes out of that. I grew up in the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America in Wichita, Kansas, and my grandparents came from Lebanon uh, many, many years ago. And so I grew up, I'm a Lebanese American Orthodox. I grew up in the church. And in those days, it was a very, um, it was a very um, ethnic community, of course, because in those days we were, our community was small. And uh, unfortunately, not knowing the fluent, being fluent in Arabic, I couldn't understand much of the, of the liturgy. 
So I uh, really grew up religious, but not really direct having a real personal relationship with Christ. Uh, that changed when I was seven, I was uh, ordained a subdeacon when I was 16, which is very young. You're not supposed to be ordained until 30 canonically, but because the church needed priests in those days, uh, the, the patriarch gave his blessing for me to be ordained by Archbishop Michael Shaheen. And then uh, most recently, I've been ordained as a deacon in the Antiochian church and uh, possibly will uh, become a priest here in the next few months, depending on God's will. So I uh, became influenced by evangelicals when I was 17 years old in high school. They invited me to a Bible study and I was very reluctant. I had heard Billy Graham on the radio, on the television, which in those days was rare and precious. And um, the Lord used him to help me to understand Christ more clearly. The gospel was made plain. I knew what repentance was. I understood the basics of the cross and the resurrection and um, made a formal commitment to Christ in my bedroom when I was about 12 years old, but no real experience happened to me until I was 17. And I won't go into the details that surrounded it, but uh, on September 17th, 1971, I was 17 years old and uh, I had uh, a dramatic uh, uh, well, you can't call it anything else but a conversion experience. I don't know anything closer to say the truth of what it was. My life was completely changed. I uh, knew very little about the only thing I could say at that time was to sing the songs that night. It was a rainy Friday night and uh, sang the song, <clears throat> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So I was... Uh, started from that. I shared my experience with my priest, Father Anthony Sabah, who was from Syria, and thankfully he welcomed it, unlike some priests that can be rather hard-nosed about these kinds of things and almost hostile to it. Uh, this priest had the wisdom of uh, knowing that God can work in many ways. So he really supported me as an Orthodox priest, and I will always be indebted to him for that. After that, I uh, wanted to learn the Bible more, so I went to Denver Seminary in, uh, in the 19, late 70s and early 80s and did a master's degree in New Testament. So my first, uh, well, I majored in religion and philosophy at, Fort, at um, in Wichita at, um, which, at uh, Friends University, a Quaker school. It was just near the house, so I went there. I, I didn't know anything more about it than that. Then I went to Denver, did a MMA in New Testament, and there I studied Western church history and systematic theology. I took much more than New Testament there, although uh, exegesis was my primary emphasis. Um, it was there in at Denver that a professor, uh, Dr. Tim Weber, was doing a class. Uh, he was a specialist on evangelicalism, and he was doing a survey of the history of Christianity, and lights turned on when we went through the fourth century and the Nicene Creed and and uh, just to show you how ignorant I was at the beginning, uh, I, I said, oh, my gosh, is that where it came, came from? And that's how it was. So uh, that really made me more interested in my roots because I was sojourning among evangelicals at that time, very grateful for the spiritual help. My personal development in Christ was very greatly helped by a pastor, uh, Mike Andrus, at the Evangelical Free Church in Wichita, still a very good friend and dear brother in Christ. Uh, he helped to disciple me. And uh, so by the time I left Denver, though, I had been convinced that the Lord wanted me to stay where I was in the Orthodox Church and be the best light I could be. So after that, I went to back home to Wichita, did a second master's in European history, uh, Wichita State, and uh, traveled to, to the Soviet Union as part of my studies, traveled to Moscow, Kiev, Leningrad, Zagorsk. And then uh, went to, after that, did uh, my Master of Divinity degree at St. Vladimir's. And there I studied with uh, many great Orthodox, really, at that time. The, the late Father Alexander Schmemann was there. I was a student of his uh, for just a couple of his classes. Meyendorf was the main person that I uh, learned the most from, and he was the dean there and the professor of patristics. And then Father Tom Hopko and 
and uh, Serge Verhofskoy was there in dogmatics. So I did a master divinity in Orthodox study. So uh, three masters, New Testament, European history, and um, Eastern Orthodoxy. I kept it all off with a doctor's degree at Fordham University under Father John Meyendorf. And Meyendorf was, I think I was his last doctoral student. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was. I uh, never had a way of verifying it, but I, he died shortly after I graduated, and I think I was his last one. But at any rate, I followed everything I've learned. My mind has been shaped by by Meyendorf. Uh, I am very much indebted to him for patristics, for Orthodox Church history, for uh, Orthodox spirituality. I give him credit. So um, there, I, he was my mentor at Fordham. And I also studied at Columbia University in, in New York and Union Seminary in conjunction with uh, my doctoral work there. So I have an ecumenical background, um, Protestant, both conservative, primarily evangelical. And then also at Union, it was exposed to very liberal form of evangelical, of Protestantism, uh, Roman Catholicism from Fordham University and Orthodoxy, of course was my main emphasis. Um, after that, I felt the need, because of that education, I felt the need to um, build a bridge between the Orthodox and Protestant evangelical worlds. Because I'd been in the academic institutions of both, and I would always raise, you know, in Denver, I would raise Orthodox questions to my evangelical professors, and they couldn't answer them. They were good-hearted and knew a lot, but they didn't know much about that. I did the same in in New York with uh, Father with the, with my professors at St. Vladimir's. They were very uh, kind and and did the best answers they could. Father Meyendorf didn't always have he didn't have a grasp of evangelicalism in a as a historical movement so much, but he definitely put signposts along the way, and is and he and I followed those later and. Sure enough, he was right. So I built a bridge. I started the Society for the Study of Orthodoxy and Evangelicalism in 1991, along with uh, invited Dr. Jim Stamoulis, who uh, was the dean of the graduate school at Wheaton College in those days. You may be familiar with Jim's book titled uh, Eastern Orthodox Mission Theology Today. That's been really a great book for understanding the nature of Orthodox mission. So we had, we had for several years, we had... Uh, Orthodox and evangelical speakers meet there at the Billy Graham Center, and we had people, Orthodox people from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Seminary, as well as from Trinity evangelicals from Trinity Divinity School, and uh, and uh, Regent College, and Dallas Seminary, places like that. Um, the the archives are now. Uh, if you're interested in doing any research on it, you can go to the Asbury Library, Asbury Seminary in Kentucky, and they have kept the tapes and some of the materials from the Society for the Study of Orthodoxy and Evangelicalism. After that, uh, the World Council of Churches contacted me in uh, 1997, I believe it was, for the first international conference on Orthodox and Evangelical people. It was held in Alexandria, Egypt, and it was hosted by now, de now departed uh, Pope Shenouda of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Uh, Father, myself and Tom Oden were the only two Americans. Dr. Oden is a Methodist scholar who's done a lot on uh, the fathers. He was the editor of the InterVarsity's Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. So Tom and I were there, and then all other people from Europe, Russia, Romania, Serbia, Greece, Syria, fantastic meeting. Um, and then finally, I would say, in terms of Orthodox Evangelical Dialogue, was uh, the most recent uh, and most lasting, in, in my opinion, the, the greatest uh, effort at building bridges is the LOI, that is the Lausanne Orthodox Initiative, that was started by um, Billy Graham many years ago, but as any of your evangelicals would know, that's a major mission agency in Europe. And um, they have had annual meetings for the past 10 or 12 years, starting with our first meeting in Albania under the uh, Orthodox Bishop uh, Anastasios Yanolatos. 
and uh, Nathan Hoppy was there who became our uh, host. And we had a fantastic meeting there. And this has been going on now. If you want to learn more about it, go to www.loimission.net. All kinds of resources. And you can see photographs of the last 10 years of all that's been going on. I uh, can't, can't uh, speak highly enough of this. It's uh, been led by a Coptic bishop, uh, Angelos, who's in London. He started it. And then um, Leslie Dahl, an evangelical, <clears throat> pardon me, an evangelical uh, woman who the two of them saw the need for communication. And that's how it got started. So all of that was a lengthy introduction to, you know, how this book came about. Uh, it's because I traveled and studied so many years in both of these traditions that I learned the language and the theological perspective of both sides. And, uh, and I've come to appreciate it. Now, there were plenty of negative experiences that I could recount, and that might have kept me from writing the book in, this, in the way in which I did, and the essays in which I wrote them, the way that they were written. But I felt like our, the things that we have in common are much more um, important than the bad experiences that uh, I, I have had in both both camps from from on occasion. Uh, in general, though, I would say that the reception has been quite positive in in unexpected ways from both Orthodox and the evangelical community. Um, uh, the um, the book itself um, is the product of. 50 years of life in both communities, even though my feet are planted in the Orthodox Church, I continue to fellowship with evangelicals and uh, write for them. I've been an author for Christianity Today and was an editorial consultant for many years and have written some feature articles for them. So the book itself um, uh, reflects my spiritual experience and theological training of over 50 years. The, uh, the endorsements were very important to me. Uh, Father Andrew Louth, a very prominent Orthodox uh, patristic scholar, wrote the introduction. And then some very nice uh, support blurbs from Father John McGuckin at Oxford, Billy Abraham at Baylor University, a Methodist scholar, and uh, also Father Ted Stelianopoulos, professor of New Testament at Holy Cross. Uh, I should say that I also have uh, have uh, relinquished all financial benefit from the book. All money, uh, I don't make a penny off of it. Um, everything has been dedicated to St. Vladimir Seminary and the training of priests and lay people there. So uh, if you buy the book, you're uh, you're helping uh, in a, in a certain in a certain amount of way helping uh, the church as well. Um, the goal of this book is to nurture in readers a faithful commitment to making the gospel clear and central in local Orthodox communities and to articulate that vision in a way that people inside and outside the church can easily understand. Uh, so it's written in two parts. The first part is primarily about how the gospel is present in the Orthodox tradition, in paying, paying special attention to its worship, doctrine, and spiritual life, those three areas. So all of the essays fall into one of those three categories, and um, it's designed for that in worship, doctrine, and spiritual life. So uh, that's what I try to do there. Now, what I do there is I try to show how the gospel is present in the liturgical life, in the dogmas of the ecumenical councils and some of the major church fathers, and then in the spiritual life, paying particular attention to the sacramental life of the church, as well as the monastic communities. So I try to show how the church presents, how it's present, how the gospel is present in the church, and then how it is manifested in these different ways. 
I don't try to give a comprehensive definition of the gospel because it's much too broad, but I do try to describe what it is, and I uh, do that in the book. I list it, um, I believe it's on page 247 or somewhere around there, where you'll find a, sort of a short summary of what the gospel is, is about. And um, so from there, I, uh, I, I try to explore that. Um, my concern is that I want to stimulate readers and scholars to a much greater recognition of the need to emphasize the gospel as the core message of Orthodox Christianity. Too often, it's my opinion that even our scholars and people that write as scholars write about important topics like Neoplatonism in the early church and its influence on the Christian tradition or a fine point in a particular patristic writing. All of this is good and essential. But what seems to be lacking is that how all of this fits into the larger narrative of the gospel itself. So I felt I feel that even scholars are missing the boat today by not adequately giving attention to the central affirmation of the church, namely the death, the resurrection, the ascension uh, of Jesus Christ, his life, the incarnation, those central elements need to be really emphasized. So um, that's what I do in part one. And here I talk about, especially if you want a shortcut and you don't have time to read the whole book or you just want to kind of go to the some of the most important parts, I would direct you to the introduction and then the conclusion of part one. The conclusion of part one is titled Nourishing the Gospel in Orthodox Parishes Today. And if you have questions, maybe later I'll be happy to answer talk about that. So that's what I do in part one, addressed primarily to show the Orthodox themselves how central the gospel is, and then those who might say that the church is really not very gospel-centered uh, or conversion-centered uh, to show them that uh, this isn't accurate. Now part two uh, turns to evangelicalism. And so my focus here is not just on the Pentecostal or even primarily on the Pentecostal tradition, but on this broader movement, which historians refer to as the evangelical movement. Now, as you might know, the term evangelical itself is very controversial, especially here in America, where the term is sometimes limited or attached to the political agenda of uh, you know the 2016 election of Donald Trump and how evangelicals got behind him. Some evangelicals did, others evangelicals didn't. Uh, and it created a kind of a, it amplified a split in the evangelical community such that today some ev prominent evangelicals don't even wanna be called evangelical because it's all has, that, has those political associations and they want it to go back to the spiritual emphasis. Other evangelicals have, are so socially minded that they, at least from the perspective of some, they under emphasize the need for personal conversion and the forgiveness of sins and emphasize more of the political and social engagement. So the term evangelical in America has that ambiguity and has those connotations. And so that's the case here. I don't think it's the same as much in Europe and throughout the rest of the world where the primary emphasis Emphasis seems to retain its stress on the spiritual side of things and the need for forgiveness and personal conversion and within the context of society, but that's the, the accent. So in part two, uh, what I do here is I address the Orthodox tradition to evangelicals. To give you a sense here of the important, probably the most important chapter for those of you that are theologically trained is this chapter, the very first one under part two, Orthodoxy and Evangelicalism and Dialogue. The name of the chapter is titled Evangelicalism Through Orthodox Eyes. That's my best attempt to provide a theological comparison and contrast between our two traditions. And uh, I would take some patience to read that. So this isn't bedtime reading, but it, it, it has to be this way if we're going to be serious about theology. So I, I 
recommend that chapter to you. The other ones are also very important, but I think that will give you the big one. And then the next thing to look at, and the last one is the conclusion, evangelicals and the church's great tradition. And there's a, a critique that I offer as an orthodox uh, toward evangelicals. So to wrap it up, I would say, read the introduction and the two conclusions, conclusion to part one, conclusion to part two, and also that main chapter titled Evangelicalism Through Orthodox Eyes. Um, so I, uh, uh, there's much I could say here because, well, the only thing I should say too is the problem of definition. What is an evangelical? What does the term mean? Who, who does it apply to? And historians of evangelicalism like George Marsden and Mark Knoll and uh, David Bebbington are familiar historians in the movement. I, I followed the more general movement uh, definition by David Bebbington, who gives four characteristics of what an evangelical is. And there he emphasizes uh, biblicism. An evangelical is someone who emphasizes the Bible as the central authority of the Christian faith. Number two, the cross and the centrality of the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Number three, conversion, the need for transformation and personal conversion. And number four, activism, that is social and uh, missionary activity, mostly missionary activity. Those four criteria of an evangelical, I think, suit my purposes most broadly because it's a very broad, as you know, evangelicalism is a very broad religious movement. And there are all kinds of evangelicals and they're united by a common set of theological beliefs, which is the one I just outlined, as well as a common experience. The common beliefs are these four kind of points and their common experience is the born again experience, the need to be into a personal relationship with Christ. And so um, the, that definition is, is very important because that means there are Baptist evangelicals and Methodist evangelicals and Lutheran evangelicals and Anglican evangelicals. It's a very big tent. So when we're dealing with evangelicalism, it's a decentralized movement. And so is the Orthodox Church. Uh, you know, if you deal with the church in Greece, that doesn't mean you're dealing with the church in Romania or the church in Russia. It's a common faith, but it too is decentralized unless it's locally, unless it's the local uh, area that you're dealing with. So um, maybe that should be uh, enough to, to, to introduce who I am and why I wrote the book and what the book is like. And maybe now I should stop talking <laughs> and let other people. Um... No, 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 uh, you shouldn't stop talking. I mean, it was a lovely introduction into your own personal experience. And I thought that was very powerful, but you didn't want to de uh, detail or uh, talk too much about the conversion experience at the age of 17. How would you qualify it in retrospect, uh, theologically? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, was it that... Uh, was that a kind of experience of a born again Christian? Did you perceive like physically uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? And yeah. if so, how would you how would you interpret with the lenses provided by, say, by Orthodox theology or by the Philokalia itself uh, that sure. experience? And also, uh, one more thing: whether you ever felt that someone like Billy Graham, um, who by the way visited Orthodox countries like Romania in 85, I think he went to Timisoara um, and he was very well received by the Metropolitan um, Nikolai Kornanu, who was there, basically the local bishop and um, who was, by the way, the translator of, of the works of St. John Klimakos, uh, that is the ladder, the ladder. And so, so when they when they met, they kind of felt uh, uh, immediately, spontaneously, uh, a natural friendship or maybe a supernatural friendship. But I was wondering whether you felt the same when you've heard uh, Billy Graham speak and when you met him in person, if you ever did. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Um, yes, my experience when I was 17 um, was prefaced by, first of all, the influence of my family and my church. It was kind of a pre-conversion preparation because I had already, Christ was already at the center of things. 
but um, what was lacking was just the personal experience. And the only thing I can tell you is when I was 12, different times, 12, 13, even 10, I had heard Billy Graham speak. And whenever he did, the Holy Spirit certainly convicted my heart and, and led me to faith in Christ. But I already had faith, but this was a dramatic turning point where I really made my Orthodox, my Christian faith a, a, cho a choice, not just simply one by birth, but one by choice. But nothing experientially happened to me other than I determined to live a Christian life. So I read the Bible more and tried to behave morally as, and, and, uh, and to tell people about Christ. But still, I was lacking that experience. So I was talking on September 17th, my friend invited me to a Bible study at a local church, and it was actually a Baptist church. I was very reluctant to go to it because it was a Baptist church. And I thought, oh, oh, I'm, you know, Orthodox shouldn't do that. <laughs> Don't go to a Baptist church, stay in the Orthodox. But I thought, well, the people that invited me were good and godly young people, and I, I admired them. I'd said, I make myself my own mind up. So there was nothing doctrinally. In fact, the, young, the youth minister that night gave a lesson on the great schism between the Catholic and Orthodox churches in the 11th century and 12th century. And afterwards, I said, oh, I heard this before. This isn't going to change me. It's just some historical information. So, but I was standing with my friend Roger afterwards, and uh, I told him, I said, Roger, if I were to die tonight, I said, honestly, I just don't think I would be with God in heaven. I said, I'm not good enough. Um, there's nothing I can do. And honestly, I'd probably go to hell if I died tonight. That's how I felt. And he said, Brad, I've been thinking about you. And you said you made a commitment to Christ. You meant it. I think that you're saved, but you just don't know it. And uh, when he, and he quoted 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may think so, but that you may know so. And when he said those words, the Holy Spirit came into my life in a way that I had never experienced before and lifted all of the guilt and the self-alienation and the depression that I had had, had at that age and, and time in life and just filled me with his presence and with joy. And I looked to Roger and I was very careful about this because I, I didn't want this, I, I was serious about this. I didn't want just to be, you know, a psychological thing. I mean, this, uh, if Christ was really who he said he was, then it had to be real, not psychological alone. And it was real. And I turned to Roger and I said, I think the Holy Spirit, I didn't know how to put it. I just said, I think the Holy Spirit just came in me. And, uh, and he said, he did. I says, I did. And you know, the first feeling I had was the feeling of joy. I was so happy that my sins were forgiven and that God was in my heart and the presence of the Holy Spirit was in my life in a way that I had never had before that I had to, I had to tell everybody the good news. So it went home that night, and as I mentioned briefly, we were, it was a rainy night. It's probably around 9, 9.30, September 17th, 1971, 17 years old. And they were singing songs, and the only song I knew was part of the words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did you and experience then, tears? What? Did you experience tears? No, no. And I didn't speak in tongues either. Um, I just experienced uh, a transformation of my human nature. My human nature was changed. I, a new humanity entered me in a way that I had never experienced before. It was a baptismal humanity. And that's what made it all the more, that's what prompted my thought because as an Orthodox, when you're baptized, it, it was a theology of baptism. It was a post-baptismal conversion. That's all you can really say it was. But how do we explain that theologically as an Orthodox? But ever since then, I mean, uh, so after 1971, yeah. September 17th, have yeah. you experienced a lapse into a kind of uh, sinful, sinful state? 
not maybe not i don't know what it, that can be described in different ways i have i have uh, been a sinner i continued to sin though not as much i won't that isn't the the dominant force in my life i didn't get into a period of uh of uh, you know denial or uh, mm -hmm. apostasy or mm -hmm. anything like that i think it would be more described as a normal christian experience of up and downs right some, some deep downs but others not so deep. but the trajectory has been upward mm -hmm. that's wonderful what so what about uh, uh, billy graham did you meet him in person no <clears throat> i didn't but i wrote him one time and they published my story in their magazine decision magazine called where are they now and they called me and did a short interview with me and i just had a short you know and those his magazine just has a short section on on where are they now and they you know summarized the highlights there well one uh, of the reasons one of the yeah. reasons why people in the orthodox world do not talk much about uh, about uh, the evangelical theology of uh, of America is because most 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 of your teachers actually have been trained in Paris, and in Paris, uh, the evangelicals were not a strong presence in the 30s, in the 40s. So Meindorf, maybe um, together with uh, Schmemann, got their theology from people like Losky and from people like Ber uh, Bertiaev or maybe uh, even Father Bulgakov. But none of these Russian theologians in the 30s were exposed. To evangelical theology the only protestant kind of theology that they were exposed to was anglicanism yeah so that's why i think in a way you are truly a pioneer and i want to really publicly acknowledge that and praise you for it and commend you for it because it's quite unique and you are really building bridges in a very very special way and as i understood and perhaps though there are like practicing orthodox here with us and we have practicing uh, evangelicals with us by the way esther Estera, she's uh, so to speak my my pillar uh, right. in the community. She's a she's a Baptist. She's the daughter of a Baptist preacher. I yes. myself Orthodox, but we have a very very mixed group. And so some of us heard you say that you still do fellowship with the evangelicals, which means you attend their uh, like services. Well, I, not so much services anymore. Although I have in the past, I. Uh much of my work now is is through reading evangelical material and keeping up with the uh, trends in evangelicalism um i do i'm happy to worship with them uh, when when it comes uh, but i most of my time i would say all of my time now that i'm ordained to deacon especially is is in serving in the liturgy in the church um but uh, my fellowship is very broad in terms of the contacts, the individuals. I'm well connected in, in America and somewhat overseas with leaders in the evangelical world. And that's the that, that's been more the nature of my more recent. But I, I yes, I mean, worship is perfectly great, you know, as well. I'll ask you a practical question about uh interconfessional, so to speak, marriages. So in uh, Romania, if you want to marry a Pentecostal. He or she has to be baptized again in the Orthodox Church. How are things happening in the United States? And vice versa, by the way, also Pentecostals expect you as, a, as an Orthodox to be, I don't know, baptized again. So it's it's a kind of very rigid sort of approach on both sides. Yeah. What's happening in America? Um, there's no, there's no uh, uniform approach it varies from as you know here in america we don't have a a single orthodox community because we're still this uh, organizationally uh disunited you have greek orthodox uh oca orthodox church in america and the antiochian orthodox each with different bishops going back to the old country so we don't have a single like you do over there in romania uh, so part of that account is accounted for that. We also have some very conservative Orthodox who uh, do rebaptize Protestants and Catholics alike. I think this is scandalous myself uh, because it's if they have been baptized in the most of us, I would say in America though, most of them 
of the Orthodox will accept the baptism if it's done in the name of the Holy Trinity. If a Pentecostal is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, most of us accept that as a valid baptism. Um, and uh, right now, the, there's this Orthodox Theological Society of America that is commissioned to study on mixed marriages. And I'm part of that group now. And we're just putting together different groups to address the question you raised, Mihal. So uh, that's a very important one on mixed marriages. The only, the only problem is sometimes that in the Pentecostal churches or evangelical churches, you don't get the you don't get the triple immersion. You don't have the triple immersion one, right. two, three. So you have just one, I think, sometimes, and sometimes the name of the Holy Trinity is absent, or sometimes, not yeah, not often. Anyway, when uh, I'll ask the last question, and then I'll ask my colleagues to butt in. Uh, when it comes to theology, so you've mentioned the Bible as a central central piece of personal devotion, but also as a central source of inspiration, and um, and that's right. But what about the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit? Uh, to what extent do you think the Orthodox are emphasizing the need to have a personal communion with the, with the Holy Spirit before you make any kind of theological proposition? Here again, we have the problem of principles versus practice. <clears throat> In principle, uh, Orthodoxy is, has a very strong pneumatology. It is very, very... Um, spirit uh i mean there's no imbalance in the trinity here uh the holy spirit has a very prominent role uh and theologically when you look at the church fathers uh they all will emphasize the importance of the holy spirit as a prerequisite for the correct interpretation of scripture uh to protect us but it's not only individual but the role of the spirit also extends to the ecclesial community and that's what's so important in the Orthodox tradition is that uh, to keep ourselves uh, within the faith, we must be uh, accountable to each other ecclesiologically uh, so that we must be in communion. So uh, structures of unity in the early church, let's say of the first thousand years, uh, assume and depend upon the work of the Holy Spirit in such things as the ecumenical councils, as well as in the personal interpretation and, and spirituality of the church. Uh, so uh, the spirit is a, an, a, an essential aspect and the fundamental uh, uh, foundation for all theological inquiry, including the, holy, including the scriptures as first and foremost. What about speaking in tongues? This is my really last question. So first of all, have you have you have you have you met people who are able to speak in tongues for real? Because sure. I was once I must say this was uh, re really like very funny. I was once in Seattle with a friend of mine who is a Pentecostal and I'm always very genuine and I'm trying to be very very honest and I give credit to the Holy Spirit and to the notion of omnipotence, divine om omnipotence in the sense that God can do anything wherever he wants and i asked a friend of mine while somebody was uh speaking in tongues and he was a pentecostal like sitting next to me in church and i said can you please tell me what is he saying and he said to me as a pentecostal to an orthodox he said no he's faking it and i said oh. how do you know that he's faking it like the preacher is faking it and i was shocked yeah I would be as a pentecostal would say about his preacher that he's faking it oh my yes so I, I just, I just, you know, I just stay there perplexed. So have you actually experienced people speaking in tongues? For yeah, real? I, yeah. In fact, uh, one of my courses uh, uh, at Denver Seminary was on the history of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements. So I have the academic background for just a course in that, which really turned on lights. Um, but experientially, which is the question you're asking is, uh, yeah, I have had that experience with people who have spoken in tongues uh but i i you know it, to me it falls into one of three categories either the tongues are authentic or they're demonically inspired or they're simply human psychology or maybe the combination of the latter two um so i i don't think it's always easy to identify when someone is authentically speaking in tongues 
and probably the best criteria was would be to test what they say uh, by the teaching of Holy Scripture. If they say something that is contrary, obviously contrary mm. to the teaching of Scripture, it's not of God. On the other hand, if it is something that is more of a personal nature, and they're and and they're prophesying in church, there has to be an interpreter. And whether or not that interpretation comes true will also be an indicator of its authenticity. But I don't think there's an easy formula for finding that out. But have you experienced, like personally, have you been uh, sort of into a, into a, into a personal state of rapture, speaking in no. tongues? No, never, never. Right. right. For me, it's hard to speak in Romanian sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes. fair enough. Fair enough. So. Uh, Friends, now we have been speaking in English, uh, I'm afraid, for about 40 minutes so far. And we have once again a very, very dear friend of ours, that is the, the Orthodox Romanians very much love Professor Brad Nassif, and we're looking forward to seeing his books translated into Romanian. But uh, who wants to, to ask a question, please raise your hand. This is a, a, a standard methodology of ours and please ask the professor whatever question you have right now. We need a cure against being shy. Uh, you know what I can, what I should say too, um, and while people are thinking, is how do I explain my experience at 17 theologically as an Orthodox? And I shared, uh, I shared uh, my thought with Father Meyendorf. I told him pretty much what I told you. And I said to him, I went in his office one time uh, during my doctoral work, and uh, I took the risk because, you know, as a doctoral student, you always want to present, you always hope the professor holds you in high regard. So you don't want, you don't want to, you know, make him think you're kind of off the, off the, off the, off your rocker. But uh, I said, well, I have nothing to lose, everything to gain. So I went in. I said to Meyendorf, what happened to me? I said, you're an Orthodox theologian. You know more than I ever will about the Orthodox faith. I says, how would you, is this Orthodox or isn't it? And he kind of laughed. And he said, Meyendorf laughed in a little bit. And he said, yes, Brad, don't let anybody ever tell you it's not Orthodox. I said, what do you mean? I, I said, can we under, can I understand it along the lines of uh, of Saint Simeon, the new theologian, and his emphasis on the need of a conscious awareness of God, and maybe Palamas as well. And he said, yeah, that would be the way to look at it. You can't. It has to be tied back to the sacraments. As an Orthodox, one's experience with God uh, like that has to be rooted in the sacramental life of the church and. So I see it as an as an expression and outgrowth, manifestation of of what happened when I was a baby. Well, that's powerful. Uh, however, I have good friends who have studied patristics and uh, the Philokalia, and who tell me what what they feel in in some evangelical circles is the fact that the notion of pentos, right, metanoia and pentos. Repentance yeah. and um, sorry, we need we need to we need to sh shut some of the microphones. So uh, the need for repentance and and compunction that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, sure. Um, that need is not is not often emphasized. So no. you have a go on, go well, on. That's, that's the beauty, you know, is that people get kind of. Uh, fidgety about the preaching of Billy Graham, but that's it. what he's doing is very basic. It's ABC stuff. The Orthodox should have no problems with that because uh, if anything, we should embrace it. And I'm glad you mentioned that he was so well received in Romania and also in Russia in those days. Uh, the need is repentance and penthos. Yes, sorrow, sorrow for our sins. And uh, I think that's one of evangelicalism's great strengths is that it captures the most important theological theme in our church, and that is the need for repentance. And uh, you just look at the monastic tradition itself for the greatest evidence. I mean, the life of Anthony, take up your cross 
and follow me. Uh, we all have to do that. So that's how I see it. How, how do you explain their success in missionary terms? The Holy Spirit, actually. I believe the Holy Spirit is, is working beyond our church because our church has a lot of problems in terms of nominalism and uh, mecha me uh, mechanistic view of the sacraments. We, many of our church people, if you look at the statistics, many people go to church, Orthodox people go to church. Very few people actually in the old Orthodox countries attend church. And uh, those that do attend, um, those that don't attend are more than those that do. So the problem of nominalism is huge, being Orthodox in name only. Uh, that's a that's a major problem uh, in our community that that I think keeps a lot of people away from the kingdom. So God is working outside of our community. He's not limited to the to the Orthodox world, and even our canons. I would argue that even canonically speaking, it's it is uh, it is a misrepresentation of the Orthodox faith to say that uh, God is limited to the four walls of our church. Uh, quite the contrary, the boundaries of the church. Are, are porous, are porous. And so we do find God working in Pentecostal and uh, uh, Baptist and Methodist uh, non-Orthodox communities, but each one has to be determined and weighed for its own merits. And we can't just make broad generalizations and say all Baptists and all Methodists are the same. Person to person, uh, person by person, it needs to be taken. What so, I've witnessed myself, because, you know, I, I travel all around Romania and we, we, we have a small publishing house and we are launching books and we have presentations and conferences. And what I've noticed, though, I'm, as, a, as, as you know, uh, I'm a pious Orthodox uh, to the best of my knowledge. I have found that, for instance, it takes me like three weeks to get the approval of a local bishop to organize something with the, with the Orthodox youth. And it takes me two days to, to, to get the approval to organize an event with uh, the Pentecostal youth. It's wow. like a huge bureaucratic machine that stifles uh, the missionary dynamism. Plus, wow. plus, plus the notion of universal priesthood. Uh, it's, just, it's just too obvious that many bishops are afraid not to be exposed, so to speak, not to be... Uh, put in a minority uh, status when when they see say uh, the laity or lay lay theologians taking over in terms of influence and and public presence. Mm -hmm. That's what, what that's what we feel in uh, Romania right now. So you have bishops, and I'm not that I'm criticizing the bishops or all, all of them, but you have bishops who tend to think about uh, their theological monopoly over uh, church doctrine and over church activities in a way which does not encourage a uh, private initiative of any sorts. And then you have the notion of uh, blessing. Okay, so did you get the blessing? That's always the question that puts me off. Did you, and sometimes I go so far as to say the blessing is a curse. So <laughs> did you get the blessing? Did you get the blessing? And I said, I always ask uh, these, uh, you know, very honest young Orthodox students, uh, the blessing to preach, the gospel, the blessing to talk about Dostoevsky, the blessing to talk about the Philokalia. Why should I ask for a specific blessing since I've yeah. spent 15 years of my life of my life doing precisely this? And yeah. yet again, you need an extra blessing. And that really puts people off because the enthusiasm which comes with the Holy Spirit is 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 stifled. Have you experienced this? Um, not so much over here. Um, although there's always that in the background, the, the, there is that, uh, that potential, but I personally have not, have not found it a problem yet. And most of my work was as a lay theologian anyway. That's because you are in the land of the free still. Maybe so. Maybe so. Well, listen, we have uh, five minutes or maximum 10 minutes to go. If you want to use the, the opportunity, I'm always eager to ask many questions, but if you want to ask our special guest, Brad Nassif, a question, a specific question, which is perhaps existential, which is perhaps very personal, do not hesitate. All the Q&A uh, uh, section of the, of the conversation will be uh, private. So this is not going to be broadcast uh, anywhere live or public. 
Okay, Father George Dinka from Bucharest. Christ is risen, Father. Christos a înviat. Adevărat a înviat. În primul rând, aș vrea să vă mulțumesc pentru invitație. Vreți să traduc? Vă rog, vă rog, okay. da. Mă gândesc că eu m-aș exprima puțin mai greu. În I, will și de asta. I will translate, I will translate, no problem. Go on. Com, 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 continuați. Din câte am înțeles, părintele a avut o revelație după ce l-a ascultat predicând pe un pastor, pe un predicator, nu știu, evanghelist. Nu? Baptist, baptist. Baptist, baptist, așa. Eram curios să, să știu dacă a fost vreodată tentat să, sau mai ales la momentul respectiv să părăsească ortodoxia și să îmbrățișeze o altă religie. Have you ever been, uh, uh, Father George, mulțumesc tare mult, Father George is asking uh, you, Brad, have you ever been tempted to join uh, uh, an evangelical congregation and to, to leave behind the Orthodox Church? Oh, yeah. Yes, very much. In fact, uh, for two years, I uh, spent more time in an evangelical free church than I did in an Orthodox church because I wasn't being fed. And uh, so I did that, but that was only for a two-year period. But I still maintain uh, contact with evangelicals in, through radio broadcasts and listening to the radio or speeches or books and individual people. What made you stay in the Orthodox Church? What? What made you stay in the Orthodox Church? The theology. I, uh, while I was studying, well, two things. The theology, because I came to believe that the church's continuity with the historic Christian community of the early centuries was authentic, that the Orthodox Church actually is the recipient Uh, of the organic continuity of early Christianity. So that's main main reason, or one of the main reasons. The other is because I believe the Holy Spirit wants me here as a witness for Christ. Uh, not, as a, not as a wolf in sheep's clothing or not as somebody who is simply playing orthodox, but somebody who really believes it. And not only believes it, but also believes that the gospel lies at the very center of the church's life. So my hope is to, and my, my calling, is to be a light for Christ in the Orthodox Church using its, using its own voice uh, to speak the gospel to our own people. Because as I tried to show in my book, the gospel is, the, uh, is at the very center Uh, of all of church life but sometimes we don't very often we don't see it it's all mixed in so my big concern is to make the gospel clear and central in every life-giving action of the church and to keep the main thing the main thing and what is the main thing the gospel how is it manifested well that's what i try to show in the doctrine in the worship and the spiritual life so we have all the resources for internal renewal. We don't have to go to Baptist or, or non-Orthodox people for this, although it can be helpful to interface and see what they're doing. But we have enough within our own church to bring about spiritual renewal, and, and it will come one person at a time. And I would say I've, I've learned over the years not to expect, uh, you know, worldwide change in the Orthodox Church, even though I would like very much for it to happen. All of us will give an account to God for the opportunities, and it's up to each of us to be faithful where we are, just as you, Father George, are where you are now. Please, the church needs your light, and uh, whatever you can do to sustain your own spiritual life, uh, whatever sources God would have you use, uh, you're in a strategic place, very strategic. So, My, uh, my only hope and prayer for a person like you would be to keep the gospel clear and central and to be courageous and sensitive. You can, we can, and somebody asked me once, well, how can we do it? Preaching is, is the, one of the main ways through the preaching of the gospel. But also in confession, when people come to confession, 
don't assume, and I'm just talking in general because I don't know Father George's approach to things, but in confession, don't assume that everybody is a committed Christian. Before I would start a confession with an individual, I'd ask them about their discipleship. Are you a disciple of Jesus? And what does that mean? It means you repent. It means you take up the cross. It means you deny yourself. Are you willing to do that? Well, what's it cost? That means that you put God before yourself, before your family, before everything. Jesus Christ becomes first. So it can be done in the confessional. It can be done at the hospital. It can be done in personal counseling. But my point is, uh, what we need in the church is we need to start at the beginning, the ABCs. And what is the beginning? Jesus himself said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what we go back to sacramentally is baptism. And what that involves, the conversion theology of our baptism is something that we as Orthodox uh, can really help our fellow Orthodox in an Orthodox way to have a living relationship with Christ and be changed. Our, our theology, our church is, is all about transformation. The light of, of, uh, the light of Mount Tabor, how Christ was transfigured and the very change of, of uh, the theology of light. It's uh, a new humanity. It's a new humanity. And there are people there that need that new humanity. They need Christ. And they need to stop relating to him just formally uh, as in a mechanistic way. Oh, I took communion or I did this, I did that. We have to, we, our sermons are too much try harder. We try harder. We talk about trying harder and it only frustrates people because they can't, doesn't get them anywhere. They try to fast more, they pray more and they're still the same person. Well, why is that? Because what we need to do is stop emphasizing, emphasis is, is what I'm talking about, emphasizing obligation and start talking about the gospel as a gift. If we start talking about salvation as a gift more than an obligation, we'll respond to that gift in the way that an obligation might, in the sense of, you know, obeying the commands of Christ. But we, we put guilt on people uh, and we say, try harder. And uh, we say it's your obligation. <laughs> and my point is, no, let's start with grace. Let's start with the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave. And so salvation is a gift primarily. And it's all about emphasis, not, not the message so much, but where you put the accents. Thank you. Uh, Father George, am I ready to put an answer or is sufficient? Nu știu dacă ne mai putem întinde și nu mi-aș dori să întârziem foarte mult, dar eram foarte curios să știu care, din experiența părintelui cu acești mari părinți pe care i-a cunoscut, care ar fi limitele acceptate ale ecumenismului? Pentru că la noi în țară discuția asta despre ecumenism e foarte delicată, a se vedea și ultima perioadă cu data pastului și așa mai departe. Deci, care ar fi în viziunea părinților pe care i-a cunoscut Părintele Brad limitele unui ecumenism acceptat? Adică di dialogul acesta între ortodox și cei de alte religii. Did you get the question? No. Uh, it was about ecumen ecumenism. ecumenism. Uh, so, so what are the limits to uh, a very ecumenical approach that some people are endorsing these days? Uh, right now in Romania there's a big debate whether the orthodox whether the, the Romanian Orthodox Church should join the Catholics uh, by celebrating Easter at the same time. And that's why we have a bit of a sort of mixed feeling here uh, when it comes to ecumenism. So, so are there limits? Uh, depends on your dialogue partner. Depends who you're talking to, but there are still limits, of course. And for the Orthodox, the, the primary, the, the supreme expression of our unity is in the Eucharist. And uh, we're not ready to take, that would be a, a, a game stopper because the limit there, the Eucharist is the supreme sacrifice <clears throat> Christian unity. Um, I would say also that uh, they're already, we already have unity with, and here in the context, even with Catholics and with uh, evangelicals, we have an existing unity, but it's imperfect and it's broken and it's not a complete and, and, and wholesome 
unity, but we need to recognize that we are already united through Jesus Christ. Uh, as far as the exact boundaries, it really depends on the person you talk to or the group that you're talking to. Um, obviously, for the Orthodox, theology is very important. And um, if there are clear differences over, let's say, the meaning of communion, how can we take communion together if one brother or sister believes that communion is simply a memorial meal, whereas we believe it's the real presence of Christ? Uh, that would certainly not be something we can overlook. The question, the difficulty is, is trying to agree on what are the theological boundaries. And I don't have the answer, and I don't think any individual does. But nevertheless, as an Orthodox, it's, our, it's imperative, it's part of our mission as Orthodox to witness to the, uh, the fullness of the church, that despite, as Father Meindorf said in one of his books, I uh, edited, I'd edited a Feshrif for Meindorf <clears throat> back in 96, if you're looking for other book things about him. Uh, Meindorf said, and if I can paraphrase him, uh, despite all historical uh, problems and human failures, there was and there is a consistent and continuous tradition of the faith held from the apostles to the modern day. And that was a hermeneutic that he he believed in, and because of that, he became a witness to the church, and I think we need to do the same. And it's up to people whether that God leads them into the church or not. They may be better off not joining the church, but the ecumenical imperative is for us to be a witness and let God do what he will with it. Thank you. And we need to listen to them as well. It's not a one-way street. Uh, we have to, because we need to be critiqued. As, as indeed, there's lots of things, especially the proclamation of the gospel, something that we need to be really concerned about being clear in, in the way we do things. A very beautiful thing that happened to me uh, recently, I called a friend of mine, called him up, and uh, he's from Transylvania. He's a, a Pentecostal pastor. And I said, how are you? How are things going? And he said, well, I'm getting ready to go to Mount Athos. And I said, you know, how come? And he said, well, there are a bunch of people around me talking a lot about holiness and sanctity and uh, transfiguration. And I heard about Mount Athos, and I really want to go there. So you have even Pentecostals interested in Orthodox spirituality, not just Orthodox people interested in their kind of uh, 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 strength in terms of mission. We have a, a, a doctor, uh, a Calvinist, I think. I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, a good friend of mine from Seattle. He left Transylvania, that is the promised land, 35 years ago, nearly 35 years ago. He's now li li living with the heathens in, in, in Seattle. And so uh, I'll give him the floor. This is Krini Rad. Christ is risen, Krini. He has risen indeed. Um, one of the things that it's interesting is that even within evangelicalism, evangelicalism um, there is... Um, quite a debate on the meaning and of the communion uh, or the Eucharist as it's called within the um, Orthodox um, circles. So actually there was a lot of debate even between say Calvin and Luther and Zwingli on the communion itself. So I don't think that even within evangelicalism, there's a, a, an understanding that the Eucharist is just a simple um, celebration. Um, and actually, I think a lot of the, the Puritans were nearly um, close to the uh, beliefs that um, of transubstantiation um, in many ways. And actually, um, Calvin was trying to say, well, it's not just a simple representation. It's not a simple um, celebration mm -hmm. of, uh, of the communion. Mm -hmm. So that what I'm trying to say is that if that's the only thing that, that holds communion between Orthodox and Evangelical, then there's no, there's, there's debates and there's the variety of, of views even within Evangelicalism. And I'm certain that many Evangelicals go to churches that do not share their personal beliefs. Yeah. Um, I Thank wrote it, my chapter here titled The Gospel We Share and the Unity We Seek, The Eucharist and Evangelicals. 
um, will address this more fully. And um, what is important here is a statement by Metropolitan, the late Metropolitan Callistos Ware. And he says, and I, don't, I really didn't say enough by just limiting it to the Eucharist, but I just emphasized it. Um, let me get this right. Found it here. The Eucharist and Evangelicals 231. Should have this in handier. I'm sorry, taking time here for you, but uh, yes, here, here he says this. Um, uh, I'm summarizing him on page 262 of my book, and from his article, "Church and Eucharist: Communion and Intercommunion." He says uh, these three forms of unity: oneness of Eucharistic communion, dogmatic oneness oneness around the bishop are complementary and interdependent and each loses its true meaning if divorced from the other two so that's a summary of his emphasis eucharistic unity dogmatic unity and the need for apostolic succession those are oh. sort of the things yeah go ahead well, we need to to put a stop to our conversation just because we promised we would stay for 60 minutes. But uh, I thank Krini Rad for his uh, very acute, uh, very astute and acute, perhaps, uh, uh, remark. And Krini, you are always welcome to come back and make a presentation of the Epistle to the Ephesians, right? Yeah, that's, that's in the making. I just finished my church, the Ephesians. Actually, we're finishing tomorrow. Please and then come back. I want to talk about... Yeah, I want to talk about the, the household codes, which is really interesting. Or we can talk about theology too, but that was, we'll get into predestination. We're going to get in trouble in this one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's the household codes that actually I want to talk about, which is actually okay. really interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll work yeah. it out. I just got a message from a friend of yours uh, that is of, of uh, Father Brad, Brad um, and that is Ovidu Druhora. Oh, you know? yes, right. Yeah. He's also connected to our circle, and he's a good friend of ours from California, from Orange County. Oh, wonderful! He, uh, he, and I, he and I discussed his dissertation that he wrote on evangelicalism, and uh, very, a very dear friend. Um, also, you probably know uh, Danutz Monasterianu. Yes, he's an Anglican yeah. right now. Yeah, he's a dear friend as well. Very good. Very, very good. So uh, we have lots of common friends. Uh, and Andrew Louth was my mentor when I was studying in Durham. I, I got my MA degree from Durham University. And under his supervision, I wrote a thesis about theology and language in the works of St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, I'm looking forward to sending you my PhD thesis published recently. And uh, once again, Father Brett, I never approached you as Father Brett. I'm sorry. I always thought that you you'd be called Brad. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. No, no, no. That's fine. I'm happy with that. No problem. Uh, for some reason, I always thought you are a young theologian around 32, 35, <laughs> uh, making a pioneering <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of research in the field. But you are very young in your heart and also yeah. in your strength. And uh, and thank you once again. I think everybody appreciated our conversation. We had nearly 20 people. Uh, completely glued into the conversation and that was wonderful and with your permission we will put uh, the presentation online and we are looking forward to seeing you again hopefully as I said on the occasion of uh, a good Romanian translation of some of your works and perhaps we'll correspond about this more specifically that'd be great thank you so much Miguel appreciate it very much this was All great of... and uh, I thank Estera as well who was very very helpful in this uh, whole enterprise and we thank you everybody we wish you good night from bucharest all the best goodbye bye bye thank you bye thank you very much for your presentation bye thank you bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.